Come on, clap those hands. Are you ready? Good news. When your heart beats, sing. When your heart beats. Come on. I want to feel it. Sing, sing. When your voice speaks. I want to hear it. When your eyes cry. I want to catch the tears. I want to know you. We say, oh. When your heart beats, when your heart beats, I want to feel it. When your voice speaks, I want to hear it. When your eyes cry, I want to catch the tears. Somebody say, I want to know you. Yeah. And we say, oh, 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 my Lord, I want to know. I 
Take my heart and form it. Come on. Take my mind, transform it. Yeah, yeah. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, oh Lord. To yours, to yours, oh Lord. I want to be faithful. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. Hey, take my heart, take my heart, heart and form it. it. Come on, sing with me. Take my mind. Free to dance and sing, free to lift my hands and worship. 
worship. Lord, I'm free. My God. Lord, I want to hear the audience. Free. free to dance. Free to dance. Free to lift. Say it again, free. Free to dance and sing. Oh, no. Free to lift my hands and Oh, worship. yeah. Lord, I'm free. My God, my God. Lord, I'm free. A little louder, a little louder. Say it. Free to dance and sing. Uh-huh. Free to lift my hands and worship. Lord, I'm free. My God. Lord, I'm free. Anybody free in here? Free to dance. Say, say, I'm a free worship. I'm a free worshiper. Come on. I'm a free worshiper. Say, I'm a free worshiper. Say, Lord, I'm free. Come on. I'm a free worshiper. Say, I'm a free worshiper. I'm a free worshiper. Lord, I'm free. Free to dance. Free to dance. Sing. Free to lift my hands and worship. Lord, I'm free. Lord, I'm free. Sing. Free to dance. Free to dance and sing. Free to lift my hands and worship. Lord, I'm free. My God. Lord, I'm free. Free to dance and sing. Free to dance and sing. Free to lift my hands and worship. Lord, I'm free. Set again free to dance, free to dance and sing, free to lift my hands and worship. Lord, I'm free. Here we go. I'm a free worshiper. I'm a free worshiper. Come on. I'm a free worshiper. I'm a free worshiper. Lord, I'm free. Lord, I'm free. I'm a free worshiper. Yeah, yeah. I'm a free worshiper. I'm a free worshiper. Lord, I'm free. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again. Um, somebody say thank, thank God I'm free. Come on, and I'll never be bound again. Oh no no no! Oh, thank God, thank God I'm free, and I'll never be bound again. Tell him again, oh, thank God I'm free. Thank God. I'm Everybody say, thank God. Thank God I'm free. Come on. And I'll never be bound again. Say it one more time. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again. I'm a free worshiper. Say, I'm, I'm a free worshiper. Come on. I'm a free worshiper. I'm a free worshiper. Yeah, yeah. Lord, I'm free. I'm a free worshiper. My God. I'm a free worshiper. My God. I'm a free worshiper. Lord, I'm free. Hey! <laughs> oh! Oh! I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. 
Freedom. 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 Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again. Oh, no, 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 no. Thank God I'm free. You know I'll never be bound again. Make it personal. Say, thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free, and I'll never be bound again. Think about the people in Ukraine. Thank God. Thank, Thank God, God I'm free. Never be bound. And I'll never be bound again. Thank you for your blood, Lord. Thank God. Thank God I'm free, and I'll never. Be bound again. Tell him one last time. Thank God. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again. Oh, well, come on and bless him. Come on and bless him. Bless your name, oh God. He who liberates and makes free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again. Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. No longer a prisoner to sin and its effects. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he came, he came to liberate. It, it's interesting as we're celebrating today. How many of you knew that today is a day of celebration? Yeah. On this day, the city of Jerusalem was partying like crazy about 1600 years ago. That's because the liberator was making his way into the city on a donkey, on a donkey. And they were waving palm branches and some begin to take off their clothing and begin to wave it before them. Somebody was anticipating something as he made his way into the city to make free, to make free. Look at somebody and say, he has made me free. He's made me free. Made me free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, I got, I got uh, just moved by the passage, and I'm going to move right into the message from that too, Pastor Bobby. Thank you. Uh, you, may, you may take your seats. There is, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you with the keyboard today, brother. There is uh, an anticipation that I have as we've been working our way through this series. And next Sunday marks the day, or as we move really into the weekend, we're moving into Passover. Passover this coming Friday. And it's, it's awesome because Passover was all about freedom. It was about covenant. It was about breaking chains. It was about moving into the blessing. And as we've been in our study on 10 things that block the blessing, I I love that we're culminating and coming into uh, Palm Sunday, Passover, and Resurrection Day, which many of of us call Easter. Uh, But he took on our enemy, which was death, hell, and the grave. Really, you see, before you, you were saved, Satan wasn't your enemy. wasn't your enemy. Uh, be, be, before you gave the Lord your life, Satan wasn't your enemy. Death, hell, and the grave were your enemy. Okay. Satan really became your enemy after, after the Lord resurrected you from eternal damnation. That, that's when he became your enemy. And so when we gave the Lord our life, his enemy became our enemy. Before that, uh, uh, you were compliant. You were a partner. You were a partner, not to the Lord, a partner to the enemy. 
And so uh, we in our actions, many of us unknowingly, some of us knowingly, uh, partnered with him to do evil in the earth, to perpetuate evil, to hurt ourselves and other people. That, that's what we were about. The, the word tells us that we were enemies of God. And yet while we were sinners, he still loved us. He still loved us. So he assigned a day and assigned a day and time future where he himself would take on humanity and in doing so walk through a lot of the the, the challenges that that we walk through and then take on what was our real enemy at that time because we were not saved he would take on our real enemy which was death and he would whip our enemy and come out of the grave liberating us from that enemy and then <clears throat> it's it's interesting because our enemies changed Easter Easter was about a change of enemies Death, hell, and the grave were broken. That no longer has eternal effect. I need some help in here. That no longer has eternal effect. That enemy was whipped. And now we have a new one called Satan. He's the enemy. And the Lord has given us orders to deal with him until he comes. He said, occupy until I come. Because there's one trying to move in territory that I've assigned to you. So occupy and deal with this guy until I come. He actually tells us over in Psalms 149, he says, render under him the punishment that's already been written. We render the punishment unto him that's already been written. And how do we do that? We do that through our praise and worship. You see... <laughs> We're not just singing a song. You need to see yourself with a club in hand. You need to, you need to see yourself. I'm reminded of the cartoons growing up and how, how, the, how, the, how the cartoons would just whack, just whack the enemy, okay? The, uh, the, the cat and the mouse would tear each other up, okay? Would tear each other up. I, and, and when I read the Bible, I get images. I get imagery. And so when I read that scripture that we're to, we're to inflict the punishment already written, when I'm doing praise and worship, when, especially in a high place of praise, I'm seeing myself whacking up on the enemy. I'm seeing myself beating up on the enemy. You see, it's why you need to get here for that part of the service. It's why you need to get in here for that part. God says, I want somebody, I want somebody to remind him of his future. Oh, my God. I, I want him to have a foretaste <laughs> of what's coming. And he said, I've assigned that duty to my church. Somebody say, whack. <laughs> it is a wonderful thing. And so as we, as we approach Easter, as we approach Resurrection Day, it, it, it speaks of a day of light coming out of that tomb and he who said he was the resurrection coming out of that dark place coming out of that dark place and then he said let the light continue and let that continue in my church don't be so concerned that it's getting so dark because the darkness has an enemy and it's you and it's me. It's you and it's me. So we want our lights to shine brightly. And as we've been teaching, a part of that light is the blessing. Somebody say, the blessing is on me. One more time, the blessing is on me. Yes. And so as we are coming into this time and we're, we're, we're about to close this series out, uh, the Sunday after Easter, we're going to have a day of light. We're going to have a day of light where we're expecting God to pour out some fresh oil for the days to come. You see, 
what he's been doing, doing during this teaching is trimming our wicks. And it's been hurtful. Okay, it's been painful. A lot of us have been going through some circumcision as he's been trimming the wicks. And that's only so he could light your fire, baby. This is, oh, I remember that song. Come on, baby. Light my fire. <laughs> he's about to light this place up. And he's going to do it through his church. He's going to do it through his church. And so we have been looking at those things that could potentially block the light from being more intense, hinder the light from shining brighter. And so as we've been saying, it sounds odd. Well, what does the blessing have to do with that? Well, the, the, the darkness really equates to curses and sin, iniquity growing in the earth. That's, that's really what it is. The darkness is all about curses and iniquity growing in the earth. So what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is light growing and blessings increasing because blessings are a part of the light. You see, what's going to draw people out of darkness is light. So a blessed marriage is going to attract people. A blessed family is going to attract people. A blessed people of God in the earth, that's what's going to attract to them. That's light. And Jesus says, you are the light. You are the light. A city, come on, a city set up on a hill. Okay, That tells me he wants to lift some of us up. Okay, He wants to lift us up so that we can shine brightly and draw Draw the remnant that are yet out there in darkness. And so we've been walking through this piece. I won't go through everything because we're in, in uh, number 10 today. Uh, but just as we approach that, uh, my goodness, my goodness. Number 9 was, anyone recall number 9? Complaining. Complaining can block blessings in your life. They can hinder blessings in your life. And... We, we were sharing with you that out of Psalms 22, 3, the word says, God inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. Now, how many of you know that Satan is a counterfeiter? Okay. He's a counterfeiter, and he mimics. He mimics in a dark and perverted way many of the things that God does. So we, we found that when the Hebrews were in the wilderness and going through a, 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 a transitory stage, coming, moving from one way of life to another, that they begin to murmur and they begin to complain. After seeing all of the incredible miracles, they begin to murmur and they begin to complain. complain. There was typically during transition there is a, a, a period of discomfort. Okay, that's very common. There's a period of discomfort. But it, the, the understanding should be that this is short-term discomfort for long-term good. Okay? Or for long-term gain. And so one has to be careful that complaining and murmuring doesn't come into play. And the word says that as they begin to do that, the destroyer came in. The destroyer came in. And I begin to look at that thing and begin to see the parallel. God inhabits praise. The destroyer inhabits complaining. God inhabits our praise. The destroyer inhabits murmuring and complaining. But wait a minute, Pastor. I thought these were the covenant people of God. Yes, they were. And we've shared with you that there are some things that can, that can prohibit that can prohibit prophecy, that can, that can limit the promises or block promises and block blessings. These are the laws of iniquity. Iniquity can override what God wants in your life. I hear it all the time. Well, what, what, what God has said for you will happen. Well, there has to be agreement in that. Okay. There has to be agreement in that. We can stop what God wants to do in our lives. 
and we can block those things that he wants in our lives from, from taking place. And so uh, we want to be found in the place of praise. We want to be found in the place of gratitude. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Into his courts with praise. Now, you may have some things to be upset about. You may have some things that you have grievances of. And it's, and it's okay to have those. Just take them to him. Okay? Just, just take them to him. One thing we learned about the, the Hebrews in the wilderness was that they never asked God. They never asked him. Moses, we're thirsty. You brought us out here to kill us. We've run out of water. I wish we'd have stayed in Egypt. Now, the, the God that just split the Red Sea, the God that was being seen in the pillar of fire, that blocked the Egyptians from overtaking them. I just watched this again last night. To, to see, see the pillar of fire. The God that closed up the Red Sea on their enemy is listening to this. And he's like, for real? Seriously? You really complaining? All you got to do is ask. Lord, could we have some water? We, we know that you can make a way out of no way. We know, we know that all the elements obey your command. You see, when you've, when you've spent a little time with him and you know what he's capable of, you'll start asking and you'll stop complaining. Lord, I remember when. This is what they should have said. I remember when you opened up that sea for us to make a way through. You bad. You bad. Now, see, this is how they should have approached him. I, I remember when the Egyptians were coming after us and, 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 and how you closed the sea on top of them. You're awesome. You're awesome. Had they approached that way, had they have come in a way that just said, we've seen you work in others, and, and I want to see you work now, had you, would, you, would you grant your people some water? They never asked. All they had to do was ask. They murmured, they complained, and that became, that became an open door for the enemy. God inhabits the praises of his people. The destroyer inhabits murmuring and complaining. Okay? So we want to be careful of that. And so that has moved us on into point number 10. Point number 10. And that one is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Let's go check out uh, our, our scripture here real quick in Matthew. Matthew 11. Matthew 11 and chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, and we're going to take a little different angle on this, but it reads, and when you stand praying, I'm sorry, Mark 11, Mark 11, 25, Mark 11, 25, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you, may forgive you your trespasses, but if, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So, so here Jesus is laying down the consequence, the consequence of unforgiveness. Now, <clears throat> there are laws that come into play because of action. All right? It's, it's not even necessarily that this is God punishing. I need you to hear this. This isn't, this isn't always God punishing. You see, sometimes there are consequences. There are consequences. Iniquitous fruit that emerges because of the action. And people want to blame God. They want to put it on God. Well, no, God says, don't do that. Don't do that, because let me tell you what comes with that. This consequence, this, this uh, entanglement comes along with your choice. And so that's why, that's why he, he tells us that we, we need to judge. Now, the, the, the whole buzzword out in the world right now, and I want you to know this is Satan. He's saying, don't judge. 
Don't judge. Well, if you don't judge, and judgment starts with me first. Okay, I judge myself. Okay, we have to judge ourselves first. If you don't judge yourself, you won't repent. There's no reason for repentance without judgment. And, and judgment, hear me, judgment is an act of love. I'm sorry, judging is an act of love. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference, as I see a few of you are kind of scratching your heads. Doesn't the word tell, tell us not to judge? Well, you need to get into the context of all of that. And he's, what he's saying is, is don't judge another until you've judged yourself so that you judge properly. But, but judging was always the intention of God for his people. I judge myself. I, ju- I get in the mirror and say, you were wrong. You were wrong. You, you didn't handle that properly. But there's a difference, hear me, between judging and being judgmental. Okay, that's... That's the big difference. We are called to judge. Anything out of order needs to be judged. Needs to be judged. Being judgmental means that I'm seeking to bring condemnation on a person. Judging seeks to bring conviction on a person. When I point out something, I'm not, it's, an, it's an act of love. It's, it's not an act of me looking down on you, especially if it's coming from someone that knows that without God, I would be in trouble myself. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But in judging someone, you're saying, listen, what you're doing is going to bring about a consequence that you don't want. Yeah. It's going to bring about a fruit that's going to make the rest of your life miserable. That's an act of love. That's an act of love. Satan doesn't want that taking place. Everything's okay now. Everything is permissible. Oh, go ahead and live together. Go ahead and do whatever you want. It's all permissible. It's all permissible because he knows the entanglements that come with it. He knows the snares and the traps that come along along with that. And so what he says to the world is, don't judge. Don't judge. That's foolish. It's foolish. That's not the word. That's not the word. When we, when we lay hands on a person to, to uh, uh, recover from sickness, I'm judging that sickness. I'm judging it. I'm saying, you don't belong in there. You don't belong in that body. Something's out of order. Something doesn't line up with what God had in mind for this person. I'm here to... You want me to judge that sickness. You want me judging that thing because you want order to come. Are you hearing this? And so it's, it's important that we understand that we're, we always have ourselves under introspection to make sure I'm lining up with the word and lining up with my father. We're always examining ourselves. And so we, 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 we find that to be the case even here in forgiving others. I understand that unforgiveness can keep me in a prison that belongs to another person. Keep me in a prison that belongs to someone else. It did something to me and I've determined I'm going to hold it against them. Well, that's only going to hinder you. It's only going to hinder you. God says, let me tell you the consequence of that. It blocks blessings. It's not my judgment. It blocks blessings. This is what comes with your choice. This is what comes with it. And so a lot of times people are talking about, see, this is the judgment of God. No, it's the consequence of your actions. There are times when God will come in and judge. Where he'll come in with a swift hand. But most of the time we're doing stuff to ourselves. And the enemy knows these tricks. If I can just get them ensnared, if I can find the open door, there's an open door somewhere. And he's seeking and roaming about finding, seeking whom he can devour. But he can't do that without an open door. 
we provide the door. Passover is all about slamming that door. Passover is about closing it and staying inside at the covenant table. Passover is about taking the blood of the lamb and applying it to the doorpost and the lintels of that door. Telling the enemy, you don't have to go home, but you got to get out of here. Pass over here. Pass over. And so as we're approaching it, we, we, we approach Passover, we approach resurrection with that song in mind, Pastor, ben, Pastor Bobby, that we sang, thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. Let me get into this. Let me get into this. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and 12. This is where we ended up last week. Colossians 3, 12. It says, put on therefore as the elect of God. Who's he talking to? Us. The elect. This isn't written for everybody. He's pointing you out. As the elect of God, this is what I need of you. Put on, therefore, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Somebody say, ouch. ouch. <laughs> Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a spiritual quarrel, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. He's saying, as the elect, this is what I would have from you. This is what I would have from you. That you have bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. And... He says, there's a, there's a posture, there's an image that I have of you, because this is like me. This is like me. I forgive people. I forgive people. The, the biggest example of f forgiveness is coming up this week, as he hung there on that cross and said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He follows his own laws. Wow. Wow. Now he was in the flesh. Very much in the flesh at that point. He was Emmanuel. God with us. Taking on carnality. To experience a lot of what we would experience. The twelve were gone. There was one. There was one there, but the others dispersed. He was alone. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He knows that the unforgiveness comes with bondage, comes with change. I wonder, I wonder if he would have been able to come out of that tomb without forgiving first. You see, some of you are in tombs that he wants to bring you out of, but you gotta forgive. You gotta forgive. Because the light is coming to break you out, but you've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. You're gonna be better on the other side of this thing when you forgive. There's a glory, there's a glory God's about to dress you in when you forgive. So this is, this is godly. You've heard the old adage, to err is human. To forgive is godly. That word means godlike, divine, divinity. That's who you are. We have divinity in us once again. And that divinity has a standard walks in a standard. Well, you don't know how he hurt me. Look at how they hurt him. I, I love it. He, 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 he wrote stuff down, then he came to live it out in front of us. He said, this is 
this is what I have in mind, mind for you. We forgive. We forgive. Now, <clears throat> watch this. I want to uh, move us on into the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15, unforgiveness. And I want to begin to take another angle to this as well. Good to have a son and daughter in the house. God bless you. Welcome, guys. Welcome. So Luke chapter 15 and verse 11, we'll, we'll start there. Now, this is interesting because this is a story also of forgiveness. But there's a couple of angles to this, and I want to I wanna point these out. The word tells us that this, that a certain man had two sons, and he was a wealthy man. One of the sons came to him and said, I want my inheritance. Separate unto me my inheritance. And uh, the other son, uh, both of them, received their inheritances at that point. And the son that came with the, with the request took his inheritance and headed off for Vegas, baby. Okay, he took off to Vegas, New York, all right? And he went all out. He went all out, hard partying, wine, women's song, and, uh, I mean, prostitutes the whole nine, nine yards and lost everything. He lost everything. And we pick, <clears throat> we pick up in verse 11, uh, because this begins to deal with uh, consequences. Have come, fruit has come. Okay. Your actions bring about fruit, good or bad. Good or bad. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man, that shall he also reap. It was harvest time, baby. He was out there sowing, going crazy, and he finds himself now broke, disgusted, busted, and feeding pigs, and desiring to eat what he's feeding the pigs. He's lost everything. All of his fun. Now, now hear this. He didn't even work for this. This was his father's labor. He didn't even work for this. Oh, this is going to hit you in a minute. This was given. And he went and squandered it. Went and squandered it. And <clears throat> we'll pick up in verse 11. It says... And when he came to himself, underline that in your Bibles. When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go. Underline that. I will arise and go. Go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him. This sounds kind of godlike, doesn't it? Saw him at a great distance, had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. Time for a party, baby. Time for a party. Break out the barbecue. 
For this is my for this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. He was dead and is alive. You see, that's the objective. Satan, this new enemy, once again, he wasn't your enemy till you got saved. This new enemy would love his his objective is to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. And he knows what sin can do. He knows what comes with it. He understands the consequences that come with it. If he can just find an open door, if he can find an area of weakness and temptation and seek to draw us into that, he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And the word says, and they begin to be married. They begin to party. But I want you to see some steps here uh, in this in these few passages, we're going to call these steps to restoration. There are steps that are, that are active here uh, as he begins to make his way back. Number one, he, he examined himself. The word says he came to himself. Watch this. Watch this. He judged himself. Sometimes the consequences will help you judge yourself. That went over a few of your heads. Sometimes the consequences will make you say, man, I messed up. Sometimes consequences will speak better than mama and daddy or advisors. Consequences. I would rather listen to mom, dad, and an advisor rather than have consequences tell me that you messed up. Because too often the consequences don't stop with an apology. Consequences don't necessarily stop with repentance. Mm. The best thing is just not to do it. Now we can come to God with it and he cleans the slate, but there'll still be stuff to deal with. There'll still be things to deal with. He came to himself. Number two, he assessed his losses cost of his sin. My father's servants live better than I do. I'm out here hungering for what the pigs are are eating. I've lost it all and now eating with the pigs. Next step, he humbled himself and he said, I will arise and go back. I will arise. How many of you know that that was going to take some humbling. Went to my father with arrogance. Now I got to go back in humility. I lost everything you worked for. I didn't even work for it. I lost everything you worked for. He humbled himself. Next step, he took responsibility. He repented. He said, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against heaven. These are the steps back to restoration. Number three, he came in low. I'm no longer worthy. No longer worthy to be called your son. I messed up so bad. I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not coming in swinging rank. I'm not coming in crying privilege. Came in low. I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. I messed up that bad. The next step, observation, was observation. He says, you were never supposed to be that person. You were never supposed to be that person. You see, this is, this is analysis that's going on now. This is him uh, implementing self-analysis. And then the last step there is learn from it. Draw and learn from the tragedy. Draw and learn from it. Now, as we, as we read the rest of the story, we, we see the father ran out. Father ran out. So he must have been looking for him. 
must have made his way to a certain point each day and looked out for it, hoping one day he would come back. And then that day came, he saw him. He saw him. Some of you that have wayward children, you need to release a prophetic word in their future that says you are coming back. You are you are coming back. You need to move ahead in, in their timeline and drop a word so that when they run into it, it springs forth as a rhema and brings about a return. Prophesy over them. Get that word in their path, in their timeline, so that when they run it, you have the authority to do this. When they run into that word that you've placed, your day is coming. Your day is coming. When you will indeed come back. I had to throw that in real, real quick here. But he, 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 he does self-analysis. He does self-analysis and with observation. And then he begins to draw from this lesson. But watch this. He would have to deal with consequences. He would have to deal with consequences. Now, the father comes out and he, and he gives the word, bring, bring a ring. Bring a ring. Let's put that, uh, that slide back up. Bring a ring, which speaks of family covenant and authority. Bring me a ring. Bring, bring my best robe and put it on him. Cover him again in my glory. In my glory. Cover him again in my glory. And bring him a pair of shoes. So this protection when he walks. And we authorize him again to walk on my behalf, to move on my behalf. Now, these things, this restorative move of the father is going to mess with him. It's going to mess with him. I don't deserve to be in this. Why is he doing this? Others that know what he did are going to look at that and have a problem with him wearing it. They know. How, how dare you? How dare you? But, but God wants to restore us. Okay, it's the plan of God to restore us. To get us back into that covenant place once again. But his consequences are going to be that others are going to have a problem with him being restored. So what are we getting at? There is still unforgiveness working here. Well, well Pastor, where is that? Well, he now has to learn to forgive himself. Got to learn to forgive himself. Anybody ever been there before? And the enemy wants to bring condemnation into your thinking. And there would still be consequences to deal with. Maybe he would run into one of those old girlfriends from Las Vegas. Maybe he would have some encounters with somebody from the past. His brother's got a big problem, big problem with him. These are some things that he has to walk through. But his attitude forward needs to start with him forgiving himself. He has to forgive himself. He has to say goodbye to that old person. That's no longer who I am. That is no longer who I am. That is. This was always beneath me. What I did was always beneath me. This is the attitude forward. And hear me. Hear me. Because this was about restoring sonship. This was always about restoring sonship. And I realize now who I'm supposed to be. When a sin is engaged in this should be the attitude forward. I have to forgive myself. I have to forgive myself. I have to say goodbye. I have to remind myself that that person's dead. That person is dead. This was, this was beneath me. I did something that's beneath me. Got to forgive myself now and embrace my sonship. He would have to battle mentally now reestablishing or walking in his sonship 
I did something. He, he told the father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Father comes out to reestablish his sonship. Okay? To get that back on track. So he, he had to forgive himself. Number one, the, the prodigal son had to forgive himself. He had to reconnect to his sonship. I'm sure he had struggles. I'm sure he had regrets. Regrets. That would be a part of, a part of the fruit. One of the phrases out there now, the enemy has everybody saying is, no regrets. I have no regrets. Everything I've done has made me into who I am. I have no regrets. Wow. Wow. There's another guy in the Bible that comes, comes to mind. His name used to be Saul. And Saul went about killing Christians. He went around binding them. He went around taking them hostage or, 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 or taking them captive, taking them back to the Sanhedrin and having them killed. Paul was there one day when Timothy was being stoned because he believed that Jesus was Messiah. He held everybody's coats while the order went forward to kill this man, kill other Christians. And then the day comes when Paul gets saved. I guarantee you he had regrets. I guarantee you that he had to deal with consequences consequences of his actions. I guarantee you there were times when he was haunted by what he had done before he accepted Jesus himself. But he would have to come to the place where he'd be able to forgive himself. It's like we've told you earlier one too, forgiveness is a decision, it's not a feeling. Let me give that to you again. Forgiveness is a decision. It's not a feeling. I'm sure that that prodigal, when he got home, he felt like, he felt like he wasn't worthy of how his father dressed him. But the feeling and the decision are two different things. But he would have to combat his feelings. He would have to combat memories. He would have to combat actions consequences of his sin. These, these things tend to be left out of preaching because uh, 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 I'm, I'm brand new. Old things are passed away, pastor. All things are become new. And we've told you that what that scripture means is that the father clears the slate. That doesn't mean you still won't reap from the consequences. Now, he wants to get us out of there. He wants to turn that, but that may take some time. So I assure you Paul had regrets for the Christians that he killed. Uh, he would have to live with that. These were consequences for his actions. There were places Paul would not be able to minister because they remembered him were people that weren't going to hear him. These are consequences. It's interesting, Paul would be called the apostle to the Gentiles. Many theologians believe it's because there were Jews that wouldn't hear him. There were Jews that had problems with him. And he did. He ran into a lot of restriction and obstacles with the Jews. So he headed outside of the problem was known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Consequences. Many go on to teach that the, the uh, uh, restraints that Paul ran into, unlike any of the others, the, the, the fights he ran into, they, uh, there were several times that uh, uh, people tried to stone him. Shipwreck. Bitten by a snake. Obstacles on every side. Many believe these, that this was fruit from his own action. 
He was there to stone others, and he had it coming back at him. Prayed to the Lord three times. This is a thorn in my side. No, he wasn't sick. Read, read the text. He starts going down through all of the struggles he was running into. Lord, can you remove this? God told him, he said, my grace is sufficient. I'll get you out of it. I'll get you out of it every time. But it's believed that this was fruit. But he's saved now and following Jesus. Yeah. This was fruit that he was dealing with. And so the best thing is just not to do the sin to start with. Okay. That's, that's the best thing. But what I love is that God comes, God comes with a ring, a robe, and shoes. And, and he, he immediately comes with those because those are going to continue to speak when you feel in some type of way. Those are going to continue to indicate who you are in spite of what you're feeling. And even in the flashbacks, God said, remember the ring. <laughs> remember the ring. Remember who you are and that that is no longer who you are. Remember that you're dressed in my glory now. And remember I've given you shoes to walk on top of the thing that would try to walk on top of you. Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. Play that softly for me. Play that softly, slowly and softly. You see, he had, to, he had to speak to himself because the mind wants to stay back in what you've come through. Anybody ever been here before? The mind wants to stay back. But you need to remember that I've been re-ringed. Re <laughs> I've been re-ringed again and that I'm dressed in his glory. God was quick to come out with these things because he knew they would speak. They would continue to speak as he would have to wrestle with his emotions and his psychology and his feelings because those things come with, with the action. He would have to fight to forgive himself. Wasted all my father's resources. How? Here's the, here's the last piece. He's got to ask himself, how did I get there? How did it happen? How did it happen? The resurrected Jesus, who we're about to come into here in just a few days rose again three days later after forgiving and then ascends he ascends and makes his way back to earth and for those of you that 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 don't know this when he appears unto Mary in the garden he tells her don't touch me don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. You see, he was in priest mode. <laughs> he, went, he went in the grave as a sinner. Word says all of our sins and our diseases were on him. He was taking my consequences. And judged. He was judged died, went in the tomb, and he resurrects, and a lot of people don't realize is that the law was being fulfilled in this. He went in as the sacrifice. The word says he came out as high priest, and now he's in priest mode. And it's interesting because when he, when he goes in, he's got grave clothes on. But when he comes out, he's got a priestly cossack on. Somebody brought the robe. Oh, my God. Somebody brought the robe. And that robe represents the glory. He actually told the father before he went in, he said, Father, Father, prepare to dress me again with the glory that I had with you in the beginning. In other words, take my robe out the closet. 
so I can take off this humanity and put your glory back on again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why I like to say the grave just became a changing room. It, be, it just became a, a closet where he would take off our sins and our diseases and he would dress us in his glory. This is why the father ran out with the robe and with the ring and with the shoes so that we could walk in authority. He's in priest mode. And the law said that the blood of, of, of the sacrifice had to be taken to the Holy of Holies and sprinkled upon the mercy seat. So he tells her, he says, don't touch me. I'm in priest mode. Can somebody shout priest mode? Priest mode. Oh, I want a shirt with that on it. Priest <laughs> mode. Don't touch me. I'm in, I'm in priest mode. And the word says he goes up to the sanctuary made without hands and takes his own blood and sprinkles it upon the mercy seat for you and for me. Somebody say, Lord, have mercy. mercy. You see, mercy wasn't free. It wasn't free. It would would come with cost. It would come with cost. He sprinkles his blood upon the mercy seat and then makes his way back down, makes his way back down to earth. And he takes time to reassemble the 12 that have scattered. He finds one by the name of Peter. He finds him where he found him the first time, out on his ship. The scenario's playing out again. Peter was a foul man when he met him. Foul man. Jesus comes into his life and he says, I'm now going to make you a fisher of men. The scenario's playing over again. There he is. There he is. He who walked with me, talked with me, ate with me. It's the same one that denied me three times. We even find him cursing again. He's gone back. He's gone back to the way he used to be. He scatters. They think it's over. Jesus appears on the shoreline as they're out in the harbor, floating. Peter's in the ship. It's interesting. He's there and he's convinced a few of the others to come along. He's there in the ship and he's naked. He's naked. They probably had been drinking. I don't think they had marijuana back then, but they they, they were probably drinking. (laughs) If they'd have had it, they'd have probably been smoking it. Gone back to the old life. Jesus screams out to them because he knew they had been fishing again all night long and had caught nothing. Jesus is on the shore, the resurrected Jesus, and he's cooking. He's cooking. You see, this was about a recovery. But he's cooking. He's cooking fish and bread. And he shouts out to him. He says, children, how you doing out there? Have you caught anything? And they shout back, no. He's there on the, on the beach cooking, cooking. He shouts out again, throw the net on the other side of the boat. Sounds like the same story the first time. So they did. And the net begins to fill up again. And one of them, they came to themselves. He said, It's the Lord. It's the Lord. Peter. Word says he threw his cloak on and he jumps in the water. Starts making his way back to shore. He's pulling the fish with him. Nakedness in the word speaks of shame. He was out there. He was ashamed of what he had done. He had dropped down beneath 
who he was. He was naked. Much like the prodigal when he came home, the father comes with a robe, let me dress you in my glory again. Because nakedness was not a good thing. Many of you thinking, well, Adam and Eve were naked. No, they weren't. They were dressed in the glory of God. They were dressed in the glory. They never knew that under the glory they were naked. The word says they were dressed in the glory. When they sinned, the glory lifted. And then the, then the word says they saw they were naked. Listen to the price of sin. The glory lifted. God comes with that coat to dress us again in his glory. And so Peter makes his way in. How many of you know that he feels horrible? Because here he is, the one he denied three times, the one that he told, I'll never leave you. I'll never, I got your back. Denied him three times. Starts cursing. I never knew him. I never knew him. I don't, I don't know who he is. There, there he is in front of him cooking what he's looking for. Let me give it to you again. Jesus has what they're looking for. They went back to an old way of living, but Jesus says, I have what you're looking for. I've cleaned it. I've taken the scales off, and I'm up here cooking it for you. What you doing out there? Peter, why are you here? What are you doing here, Peter? I told you to meet me in Jerusalem. What are you doing here, Peter? This is beneath you. I told you I'm going to make you a fisher of men. What are you doing here? Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Three times, because he denied him three times. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? And basically he tells him, he says, get back to work. Feed my sheep. Get back to work. Get back to who I made you to be. Put your sonship back on again. Get, take my shoes and... Put, glory, put my glory back on and get back to what I called you to do. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. You got to forgive yourself. You got to forgive yourself. I guarantee you Peter wrestled with it. Look what I did to him. Look how I disappointed him. Look how I denied him. And look at this mess that I'm dealing with. Look at this mess. So he's, <clears throat> Paul too in this case, or Peter too, he has regrets. He has regrets that he has to deal with. These are natural things that take place. So what's, what's the best way to combat this? Number one, I have to remember that I have been re-ringed that I've been redressed in his glory and that I have shoes to walk on top of those things that once ensnared me and entrapped me. I've been given shoes, hear me, to walk on top of trouble, to walk on water. I, I walk with he that walks on water and that I'm to get back to who I was supposed to be. Now, here's, here's the deal. Because Paul would have a real problem. It's interesting. Everybody knew him as Saul and knew what he did. Even, even the 12 took issue with him at first. And he would have to be humbled as well. You read the story about how the Holy Ghost met him one day when he was on the road to Damascus, getting ready to go and kill some other Christians. I read where the Holy Ghost took a baseball bat and swacked him right upside the head, knocked him off that horse, 
and begin to confront him. And it's interesting because Paul or, or Saul at the time, he then comes to himself and he says, who are you, Lord? <laughs> who are you, Lord? And the Lord goes on to explain who he is. I'm Jesus of Nazareth who you persecute. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a hold of you and use you for my glory. You're going to have to deal with some things from the past, but I'm going to get a hold of you and, and use you for my glory. And it's, it's interesting. He says, uh, uh, I'm going to have to change your name because the old one has some consequences attached to it. I'm going to have to change your name. I'm, I'm going to call you Paul now because uh, uh, Paul means humble. You walked around arrogantly in days past, but I'm going to humble you for what's ahead of you. I'm going to humble you. I'm going to bring you into a humble place, and I'm going to use you for my glory. And so what's going to help, what's going to help Paul along his journey? Well, his new life would have to begin to speak. His fruit would have to begin to speak. Everybody knows the fruit of Saul, but they got to get to know the fruit of Paul. Now, this will take time, but, but word will get out and, and evidence will begin to present itself that, that, that there's a new man in town by the name of Paul. Has anybody seen this guy? Has anybody seen the signs, the wonders, the miracles that he works in? The way he's able to, to preach forth the word of God, his fruit would have to start speaking for him and the new fruit the new harvest would have to grow to a place where it would overshadow the old and those who wouldn't hear him last year might listen to him this year because there's new fruit coming from this new person that he would have to forgive himself he would have to forgive himself. Had he not have embraced the new him, it would have hindered the anointing. It would have blocked the blessing. Had he not have learned to, to think about the new thing God was doing in his life, he would have been a lesser light in a darkening place. So the forgiveness piece, I forgive others, I also have to learn to forgive me. This is a fight for my sonship. It's a fight for my sonship. Repeat this after me. I forgive myself. My father, my father forgave me. He put a ring on me. He put his glory on me. And he gave me shoes of authority. I'm his covenant child. I have new fruit coming forward. I'm producing a new harvest. One that brings life and not death. I am a son of the most high God. Oh, come on and wear it. Come on and wear it. I'm a son of the most high God. That's who I am. That's who I am. I may not be perfect, but I'm getting there. I'm maturing. I'm maturing. Walking in my sonship. Hear me again. This is a fight for your sonship. You were never supposed to be that person. You were never supposed to fall into that. And when the temptation tries to come knocking again, you, you show that temptation your ring. You, you, you show that temptation your robe and you take those shoes, that foot of authority, and you step on it and you say, that's beneath me. That's beneath me. That's not who I am. I forgive myself. Raise your hands right here. And Father, let, I pray, a compassion come upon the minds, the hearts that are digesting this word, one that allows them to move forward from 
the mindsets of the past. Yes. I remember what I did. It still haunts me. I remember who I was. It still bothers me. Bless all watching and all here, Father, to embrace their sonship. To move ahead in their newness. To walk on top of those things that once walked on top of them. Behold, your sons, your daughters, enable us, grace us yes, to walk on top of trouble. To walk on top of those things that once ensnared us. And may we bring forth fruit. New fruit that takes us into eternity. In Jesus' name. Now come on and shout and give the Lord a praise. Come on and give him a praise. Hey, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I'm free. God bless you. See you next week. I'm free. And I'll never be found again. Thank God I'm free, and I'll never be bound again. Come on, sing that one more time. As a son of God, as a son. Thank God I'm free, and I'll never be bound again. Oh, thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. And I'll never be bound again Because I'm a free, I'm a free worshiper Yes, I'm a free worshiper I'm a free worshiper